Welcome to the pilot episode of Security This Week. I'm Carl Franklin, and with me are my friends Patrick Hines. Hey, Patrick. Hey, Carl. How are you doing? Good. And Dwayne LaFlotte. Hey. How are you, Dwayne? I am fantastic. How are you? Excellent. Good, good. So, this being the first episode, we have to answer the question, what is this? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> are we getting existential on that or are we just saying yeah. what the podcast is about <laughs> what is a podcast anyway <laughs> um uh, i'll just introduce myself briefly i've been podcasting since 2002 steadily and i haven't stopped um my flagship podcast is called dot net rocks it's for software developers on the microsoft dot net platform which has morphed from a Windows-centric development technology framework to an open-source cross-platform framework. And if you don't know what that means, don't worry about it, but it's kept me uh, in podcasts for low these many years, and we're on something like almost 1,800 episodes now. So That's so many. I was the first guest on your .NET Rocks podcast, which I thank you for that. Um, but Talking I Talking about up, security. Exactly. And, <laughs> and I've been in security since uh, shortly after getting out of the Army back in the early 90s. Um, I was a infantry platoon leader, and so there'll be plenty of war stories and military analogies from me. Uh, right. but, but talking about security is one of my favorite things, and so that's one of the things that we're going to be doing here. That's probably the fi- primary thing we're going to be doing. And you and Dwayne have worked together for a long, long time, um, and you're in the security business, the I, the IT security business, right? Uh, yeah, we do everything from code reviews to red teaming to to building custom security hardware. Uh, we we do quite a lot of things. Dwayne runs most point on almost all of our red team engagements. Uh, red team, got, what's that? I'm I'm the dumb guy, uh, so I have to ask the dumb. So let, I'll let Dwayne take yeah, that. What's so, a red team? Dwayne? So a lot of people talk about um, you know penetration testing or security testing, and a lot of that amounts to uh, you know doing standardized scans and using tools and that sort of thing. Red teams are entirely different. Uh, a red team, or they're mo- now moving more over to calling themselves adversary emulation teams. Uh, um, hackers. Yeah. So these are the these are the high end teams that are trying to emulate what uh, what APTs or advanced persistent threats or nation state level actors are doing um, at, against a company. So we'll have a company hire us and say, "Hey, listen, you have three weeks." to break in to our company and, and see what you get access to. Um, and, and I don't want to put you guys on too high of a pedestal, but you deserve some accolades here. Can you brag a little bit about what you guys have done? Um, I think Pat? so. Um, so, sure. So Without it, specifics? Really, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> without specifics. Let me, let me give you an Establish interesting story. Establish your creds. Let sure. me give you an this is a hard thing. This is a hard question because everyone's an elite hacker. And everyone's, you know, no one, no one says, well, I'm a mediocre hacker. Everyone says they're the best and they're scary and all that. So, uh, about a, two years ago, we decided to, to put it to the test. And there's a, a, a group out of, uh, the UK, uh, in that made a, a website called Hack the Box. And that's Hack probably the box. The, Hack the Box. Um, Hack the Box. Hack the Box. Hack the Box. EU. It's kind of, sounds like a convenience store. <laughs> it does. And, and I wanted to put ourselves to the test. And because we can tell war stories about which clients we've dealt with. And we've done this for the military. We've done this for financial institutions, et cetera. And the FBI, too. Yeah. You've worked with the FBI, right? I, I had a clearance with the FBI for a short while and, um, and various things over the years. Dwayne's been in most of the Fortune 500 in one way, shape, or form over the last 20 years, as wow. have I. But, okay. but it's, it's hard to, to quantify. So I, we wanted to quantify it. So Dwayne, myself, and the two other oldest guys, cause we have a lot of young guys and, uh, and ladies that, um, work for us. And we figured we'll see what the old people can do. Uh, we formed a <laughs> hack the box team. There's about 50,000 teams on hack the box as near as I can figure, but uh, about 300,000 hackers around the world. All right. So is it like a contest kind of thing? Or? It's like an ongoing Olympics, I call it. There's 20 boxes at any given moment that are available to hack anything from a simple box where you just have to do, you know, a lookup and do something uh, uh, with okay. Metasploit. Box meaning a computer. Computer. I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then there's others that go all the way up to the point where you have to live off the land or they have multi-factor authentication you have to defeat. So they get really, really hairy pretty quickly. Okay. At any given time, there's 20 of those boxes and um, you get points for hitting the boxes, getting system, getting user. And so it's a test. It's a finite All right. test. So the, the goal is to 
get into it, to hack into it. And they're Hence the name, hack that, the box. Yeah, hack the box. So they they put up barriers, they may they try to leave uh leave gateways or doors or they, ways they, in that that aren't so easy to figure out. They pretty much take a a, a, sol- a solidly secure box. Mm-hmm. And then they open up small vulnerabilities by either not patching something or leaving a little bit of code that you can discover. But this is amongst – sometimes you might find a little patch of code amongst 50,000 lines. Yeah. Okay. And, and it might be it might be something super simple. Um, like let's take a membership website. You have a website um, and you can log into it and you get to set your profile picture. And that's cool, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And maybe when you set your profile picture, instead of uploading a JPEG – I upload an ASPX page as my profile Ooh. picture. And for those who don't know, an ASPX page is code that executes on the web, <laughs> code and markup. So then at that point, now that I have this ASPX page um, and I find out where profile pictures are stored, I just call that page directly. And at this point, I might get a remote shell on that server, which is literally like sitting at the command prompt, be able to surf remote the drive and, and do whatever you want to do. And that's that's considered relatively simple. Um, so you say, oh, well, I'll only allow certain extensions. Those can all be right. mostly bypassed as well. So, so those those types of things are what you're discovering. So Neat. Th- now that we've set the stage, we did this as an experiment, and within about four, three to three and a half to four months, we went from doing nothing on Hack the Box to let number seven in the world. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Seven in the world. We got to seven. Yes. out of, out of, out of fifty thousand. About wow. Teams. We got all the boxes. Basically, the only way we could have gotten a higher score is if we sat up on t- Saturday mornings waiting for the box to come out and get it early. <laughs> then you get and we have points. lives. Yeah, we have lives. We're not. <laughs> oh, because so they're in the UK and about. you're on the East Coast well, and, and you would have had to be up at three in the morning we, or whatever. And we have lives. We didn't want to sit there and try to get it as fast as we can. Um, okay. So, so we, we were happy with number seven and then we went back to our day jobs and we our, our ranks probably dropped quite a bit now. All the boxes have been replaced. So someday we'll go back and do it again. One of the things I would say that's super important here, though, um, for, for listeners is, um, you know, I consider our teams to be cutting edge. Uh, our, you know, we've, we've developed zero day exploits, which for those of you who might not know, these are things that aren't patched um, by reverse engineering firmware and, and creating our own code. Uh, wow. And every day, my team feels dumb. Every day. We That's we goal, we huh? think to ourselves, you know what? There's so much going on in the security world. Maybe we should just quit and go. So if you bakers. guys feel dumb, <laughs> it makes me feel absolutely <laughs> moronic. And the listeners probably going, blah, 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 do I even deserve to listen well, to this? We show? used to have this thing called imp- imposter syndrome, and it's still real in in the tech industry. Yeah. But in the security world, it's even worse because people know they don't know things. Yeah. Uh, like I'm I'm a developer. Dwayne's a developer. The other two guys on the team aren't hardcore developers. They're good at scripting. And so there's some things that we take the lead on. There's some things that they take the lead on. Uh, one of the guys is a is a drop dead expert on 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 cloud security. And so we each have our strengths, and that's what makes a good team. Okay, so almost ten minutes into the podcast, we've established your credibility. I think I've established mine. I've been podcasting for a long time, and I know how to ask questions, and I know how to be the dumbest guy in the room. So I think. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you you we are move a facilitator on. of of epic proportions, Carl. Okay, I can tell well, you that. there you go. Um, so let's move on to the next thing we need to disclose, which is how does this podcast work? Like, what can you expect every episode? And we got together. We agreed we wanted to do something about security, but we also wanted to tie it to current events because let's face it, the news is full now of breaches and. Our friend Troy Hunt seems to be in the news all the time because he has this website where you can look up to see if your uh, email address has been compromised. Yeah. And yeah. And so, so we wanted to start with something recent that has happened, talk about it and figure out, you know, maybe we can talk about how, takeaways. how it works. Yeah. And yeah. then, and then takeaways in terms of what can you do? And who's you? Who's listening to this? Who should listen to it? I'm thinking that, yeah, tech people should listen to it, of course, but also ordinary people who just want to, you know, not have their Windows boxes or Macs or whatever hacked into and business owners who make decisions about security and who are interested in keeping their 
systems up to date and secure. Information is power in this space. You have to know Absolutely. what's going on. I, I remember when when I've done a lot of presentations, the best security presentations are the ones where some manager jumps up and runs out of the room <laughs> because you've just yes. covered something that they realize they're wide open on. And yeah, so hopefully I've, we'll I've reveal some of those things. So the, uh, again, you do not have to be a software developer, even though the three of us are, we're going to try to make this accessible for everybody. Absolutely. Yeah. And okay, so that brings us to our first topic. And I know that you guys watch the news and I've seen a couple of things this past week, um, a Windows 10 vulnerability, mm, some Wi-Fi stuff. Yes. What do you guys want to start with? Let's start with Windows. Uh, yes. Okay. The, the SAM file is always a good place to start. <laughs> the SAM the file. The SAM file. Serious SAM. Um, so we can talk a little bit about that exploit. Um, Microsoft, unfortunately, you know, they are they're some of the best in in the in the industry, especially looking for exploits and that sort of stuff. Um, and you know, they're some of the champions of shutting down botnets and that sort of thing. And even yeah. even with the brilliant engineers they have, things happen. <laughs> Um, yeah. so earlier this month, uh, and, and middle of last month, um, they had a big sort of storm around printers. I don't know if you guys knew this print nightmare, uh, but yep. print nightmare came out where you as a normal user on a computer could leverage the printer service, the spooler service to elevate so yourself minute. to an administrator oh, on the okay. box. Let, let's unpack this. So. What did you call it? Print monster? What? <laughs> print, print, print nightmare. Print nightmare. Print nightmare. All right. So that's the name of the what? That's that's the um, the hacker dubbed name. There's a CVE that goes with it. I'll, we'll have to post in some of the notes. Okay. Um, that okay. Explains so it. so the exploit itself is called printer nightmare. Yes. And, and now, what do you mean by elevate access? Uh, exactly. That's a good point. So if I'm a normal user, let's say on a computer uh, on a corporate network for the most part. Um, generally, I'm not going to, my administrators on the network are not going to give me the keys to the kingdom. They're not going to say, hey, you're an, you're an administrator on your own computer, install whatever you like, shut down the antivirus right. software if you want to. Um, we don't care. Nobody does that. For the most part, you're running as a low privilege user, someone who can only do their job, um, open word, whatever, and, and aren't going to then have administrative access to your computer. Right. So the first thing a hacker does or a red team when they get on a box is we want to elevate privileges. We want to start off with this low priv or no privilege user and we want to get to yeah. administrator locally so we can set up a home base and start working our way into the organization. All right. So when you when you have a box, a computer, there are accounts mm -hmm. on that box. And Windows 10, right out of the bat, the first account you create has administrator level access, doesn't it? It does. Yes. Yeah. And so the whole thing is most people use their Windows 10 boxes, you know, and I'm talking about people who have the personal computers that aren't maybe connected to a controller, domain controller, active directory, or some of the other things that businesses use. But um, they, they don't have, you know, if you're in a business and you're an employee, you probably don't have administrative access to your machine. If things are done well, yes. Yeah. Why? Why wouldn't you do that? Why wouldn't you want your users to have administrative access? What could go wrong? <laughs> yeah, well, that's a, actually a legitimate question. I mean, we're laughing yes. about it, but... No, I, I think it's an important question for us to answer because Let's a lot of that. users don't know why they don't have administrative access because yeah. it's, it's inconvenient. So security is often the enemy of productivity. We want yeah. better productivity. Productivity is money. But Security is a tax on productivity because the problem is, it, Carl, if you have the ability to write to all the folders you ever need to access, even if you don't need to write to them, then if you get infected by ransomware, you're going to be able to write that ransomware is going to write to all those files. All Whereas right. if 90 percent of the files, you only need to read them and you're only given read access. Well, that means the ransomware can't write those files. It can't ransom them. It can still steal them, but that's still better than them destroying them. And you use the the R word there, ransomware. That's another type of exploit that has been in the news lately. But uh, and it relates to Windows too, doesn't it? Because a lot of any Windows place users, there's data. Any yeah, place there's data can be ransomware. Right. Okay, so let's talk about Serious Sam. Yes, so coming to Serious Sam. So moving aside from printers, right? You can yeah. manipulate old print code and get yourself to elevate to an administrator and that sort of stuff. Uh, and then researchers just recently found, okay, 
that sounds like a lot of work. Why don't I just go and, and read through the SAM file? Um, and the SAM, for those of you who might not be sort of deep into the Windows world, um, that's the accounts manager. It's the accounts database. So it's literally yeah. the file on your computer that has the information about the users and their password hashes and what they have access to. Um, and it's usually hyper locked down and it's in a vault somewhere that only the system can access. System level privileges can access. And even on okay. top of that, it's a locked file. So it's not something you're going to be able to even generally open. Um, and Sirius Sam is a new exploit found where the exploit, it's going to be super complicated. The exploit is uh, Microsoft forgot to lock the file. They forgot to put the right ACLs, uh, the access control Ackle. list. Mm -hmm. Who okay. can touch that file? Um, that permissions for the last, I believe, two years, um, it's been opened up in Windows 10 and Windows 11. It's like finding out that there's a laundry chute to the panic vault, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> so it's interesting. And so, yeah. And so, I guess the antidote is to make sure you're up to date because if I know Microsoft, they have a patch out as soon as they discover it. Hours later, there's a patch. It, it really patching and using current systems is the best defense yes. for 90% of the yep. things that we see. Yeah, and Microsoft was really good about not only assigning this to CVE, um, which for those of you who don't know the terminology CVE, it's, it's a um, common vulnerability is sort of a number that's assigned to a vulnerability. So we don't talk about printer nightmare and we don't talk about serious Sam, okay, right? Yeah. Because those types of things are kind of ubiquitous in the, in the, the world of hacking. Right. Um, but there's an actual assigned number that you can look up and say, okay, what are the ramifications and what's the solution? And you're right. Microsoft did. They released a quick patch that, that shut down access to this file again. Um, and there's a little bit more complicated than that. I mean, you had to use volume shadow copy to pull the file, et cetera, because it's still locked by the system. But um, but if you go to Windows System 32 uh, slash config slash SAM and do a directory, mm -hmm. do a dirk, will you see it? Yeah, you will see it. Yep, you'll see it there. You shouldn't be able to touch it or, or, or open it because it's locked. Now, there's this technology in Windows called volume shadow copy that is specifically designed for copying locked files. Um, but this specific file and a couple other special files are even locked when using VSS because you don't want people just saying, hey, let's back this file up somewhere and then read it. And that's where the the vulnerability lied. It uh, yeah. you used to not be able to back that up in that way. And now you can as a normal user and read that file. Now you have the administrator's username um, and their hash, which you could then parade as them on that computer. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So it's a bad one. I, here's another uh, term that you just used, hash. Mm. So I think I can explain this. Um, this is a... Without using the word corned beef. Yeah. <laughs> or salt. Right? Oh, well, you might need to use salt. <laughs> I might need to use salt. All right. These are, we're geeking out here. Um, so modern systems do not take your password and store it in a database as is. No and then text. when you enter your password, check it against the password in the database. That's not how that works. They instead use a one-way encryption technique called hashing. And, and hashing uh, is an, uses an algorithm mm -hmm. to create a derivative string. Let's say if your password is, you know, the name of your cat, Fluffy101, and uh, you encrypt that. You get a string that looks like a cartoon character swearing. <laughs> you know, it's just a bunch of gobbledygook. And that gets stored. And here's the thing. You can't – it's a one-way encryption. So, you can't decrypt it back into the password. Yeah, hashes are one right. way. Hashes are one way. So, you can create them. Well, what good is that? Well, here's what you do. When I enter my password to log in, the system hashes what I logged in. And compares the hash to what's in the database. So that way the password never has to traverse the network. Exactly. And it doesn't have to be saved in any yeah. database. Now, the risk there is, sure, could I take that hash and run it through a massive dictionary list and use and try and hash each and every word in that dictionary list and find your password of Fluffy 101? Maybe. Maybe. But if it's a super long password, probably not. And you don't mean sitting there one at a time, uh, <laughs> no, 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 102. You mean a, a program that does this very quickly against a huge list. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We can guess uh, anywhere in the order of about 3 billion passwords a second here with our, with our computer setup that we have with our, our cluster. We have a big we cluster. Do. Um, 
eat many, many uh, video cards, cracking passwords all the time. Um, but what's wow. really neat in this, this sort of vulnerability is other computers on the network that you try to talk to or services, they don't need the password either. All they need is the hash. So if you can get to this right. SAM file and you can get this hash, then you can just use it. Use it like a password. Pass that hash along to other computers and it'll go, oh, cool. You must have known what the password was. And they give you access. It's called pass yeah. the hash. Yeah. Really? So so if, I, if I'm prompted by Windows to enter the administrator password and I have the hash, I can paste that in? or and No. You can't paste it in because it's going to try and hash whatever you paste in. But... Yeah, of you course can it'll use, hash, um, hash. There is there's a remote <laughs> uh, desktop protocol. You can use an RDP program on a Linux station or a Windows station. And if you use okay. it as command prompt, you can pass the hash. You can say, I want to use the hash instead of a password. And it'll think that the program did it. All right. So the RD, RDP, RDP is remote desktop well, protocol. 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 It's yeah, a special so this client. Is, this is how we connect remotely to machines that are in the cloud, or virtual machines that are in the cloud or in other places. So, Yeah, so the, what, what's going on here is that the computer trusts what it receives because it has no way to validate. Right. And so I can control what I send mm -hmm. to it. So, for example, um, there's lots of attacks that we'll talk about over the next months where the computer receives, that the target receives a package that we've custom crafted and it doesn't actually come from the web page and the interactions they envisioned. It's one we, we custom crafted. It's kind of like the ping of death. If I send you the ping of death, you process it innocently and it causes your system to lock up, but I didn't send it through a normal channel protocol. I crafted it so that it would come and do the damage. I remember the ping of death. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it was, uh, so ping is a protocol that, you can use that we use in the IT all the time to determine if another machine is up and running. Right. Yeah. And it, it basically is an echo. Yep. Right. It, exactly. It, you, you, you send it something and it sends it right back to you. And so you can see if a machine is alive. Now here's the problem. Not all machines respond to ping like machines that are virtual machines in Azure don't respond to ping. Well, because but you have to turn them on. If because the history of things like the ping of death. They've learned <laughs> yeah. that it's not a good thing to do all the time. Right. So the ping of death was a specific chunk of data that had some special thing in it. It was a malformed ping that basically caused the computer to not be able to compute. Yeah. And it was like the old c cartoons where the robot would self-destruct. <laughs> right. right. Very similar. Yeah. You, and it was real. I mean, I, I tested it on my machines and yeah. my machines died. You, basically, you cracked, you crashed the um, network stack and it caused yeah. the machine to reboot because it was a kernel component. Crazy. And that was in the 90s, yeah. I think, yes. right? Yeah. So using yeah. A, a similar tactic, right? There are tools out there where you can, you can pass the hash and you can say, hey, listen, let's assume I already typed in my password and this was the hash. Use the hash instead. And the remote computer will yeah. just use it. Um, and now you have access as, uh, as that user somewhere else. So I read in this news story about Windows that it was discovered by accident while testing Windows 11, yes. which is the new upcoming version of Windows. So do you, do you want to talk about that a little bit? It, it's interesting in that it was discovered in Windows 11 because initially they thought, okay, this, this might be a, just a Windows 11 thing. Right. This might be something yeah. they missed in testing. So they went back to start looking at older versions or the, the current versions of Windows 10 and realized it's been there for a while. Um, so you might say, OK, well, why was it? Why was it there for potentially years? Um, security right. researchers have tried copying the SAM file over VSS decades ago. And when it didn't work. What's that? Wait, 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 wait. What's VSS? Ah, sorry. Volume shadow copy. So the volume. Now, what is that? We we have to go down these uh, rabbit holes. <laughs> That's why I'm glad listeners. you're here. Force yeah. me to explain these things. Uh, so I'm the acronym police. <laughs> so volume shadow copy is is the ability for you to, um, in essence, get a copy of files that exist on a Windows hard drive, just like backing it up. Um, but you're doing it to any file, even if it's locked. So let's say Windows is using core functionality on your your computer, like the SAM files, locked all the time. It's being right. used. So another application can't come and just say, hey, I want a copy of it because it's, it's literally locked. That's right. So VSS yeah. is the ability for the drive to take a block copy, if you will, of that file and still copy it even though it's locked. 
And it also in, has a feature that a lot of people may be familiar with is if you've ever gone onto your computer and looked at old versions of the same file where the computer automatically kept the version from last week and last mm. October and last. Yeah. If you've ever done that, that's vo- that's VSS that's providing that service. So you don't have six copies of the file, but the computer kept track of the changes and it can recompute any version of the file that it still has. Yikes. Wow. It gets fairly complicated with block level stuff under the covers, but suffice to say, it's a way to, it's another copy of the files that's available to the system. And it's therefore another mode of accessing the files that hackers can exploit. So here's the thing too. If you have an older version of Windows, Windows 8, let's say, or even Windows 7 or Windows XP, uh, are those, I mean, first of all, shame on you because you shouldn't be running those. <laughs> Agreed. I, I think, I think for, this goes back to seven. It goes back to seven. I think. Am I wrong, Dwayne? Uh, I, I've, only, I've seen Windows 10 and a couple versions back, but I've not seen how far back it goes yet. I don't know how, I don't know how many, uh, you know, attackers are looking at Windows 7 and Windows XP or Millennium. Wow. <laughs> so is that the security route? Just go back to the old <laughs> ones? Then you can. <laughs> yeah. No, let's disclaimer right. that right now. No, we are not suggesting you go back to old. No, version. Microsoft did patch um, it, I, and it it it's uh, definitely always patch your software, people. That's that's one of our hard yeah. rules. Yep, this is a perfectly good reason why. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So that's a little bit scary. So uh, essentially, you should go to uh, to make sure that you're safe. You should go to Windows Update, and you should make sure that first of all, you're up to date. And if you're not, why aren't right. you? You you probably don't have automatic updates installed. There are some machines that I have that I don't have automatic updates because I use them in production, uh, in music and video and audio production and streaming, and I don't want them rebooting. You know, while I'm while I'm doing that. So, but they are standalone machines. I'm not so worried about an exploit, but I do. It it uh, is a reminder that I should go you know, and do Something that else. on a weekly basis. I did just verify that Windows 7 is vulnerable to print nightmare. Wow. Well, that's print yeah. nightmare. We're, what about the Sam, yeah, serious Sam? Sam. Uh, we'll let you that one. But yeah, wow. all my all my systems are set to automatic update, automatic reboot. I'd, I'd rather be in the middle of something and then a new patch comes down and, and it say, hey, do you want to do it now or later? And I say later and when I stop using my computer, it, it reboots and does this thing then forgetting for months and then (laughs) being vulnerable. Wow. So there's now there's so many things that we can talk about that didn't happen this week, just to educate our listeners. Um, Maybe we should just talk about some terms that we might be using some more, uh, a glossary of terms. You you mentioned ransomware and I can't imagine anybody who's listening to the news, not understanding at least in a cursory way uh, what ransomware is. So, let me, let me talk can, about that one if you don't yeah. mind. So the idea of ransomware is that if I can get a, a foothold on your system and get credentials of any kind on your system, then there's lots of things I can do. I can steal your information. I can, you know, spy on you. I can, you know, get your system to do things for me, such as, you know, crypto mining or visiting a website or, you know, doing impressions or blog posts. This, this is the classic things that we dealt with. But a number of years ago, more than a half a dozen years ago, um, somebody decided, well, what if I took the control I have over the system and I encrypt all the files with the key that I, the attacker, only have? And then I put a file um, on the file in, in place of the files or in each directory that tells you how to pay me a ransom. And cryptocurrencies make that quite easy nowadays so that you can pay me. I'll give you the key and I'll leave behind a program that will decrypt the file. So I'm holding your files ransom by encrypting them. And that's the basis of it. Now, first of all, who is the brilliant guy that said or, or girl who said, hey, you know what? Windows needs a way that I can completely encrypt a hard drive and without the key, you're completely screwed. <laughs> Who's the genius that figured right? that out and why? <laughs> Maybe it had good intentions of protecting the data. Well, they're not, they're, they're not using a Windows function call to do it. They're just doing it. <laughs> okay. So it isn't anything that's built into Windows that no. they're turning against you. No. But it's the fact that they have 
they have taken over some credentials. They have some access. They have some remote code execution, RCE. Another term. Uh, where they can, we'll, we'll be throwing where they around. Can take over your system, RCEs. Where they can take over your system, mm-hmm. right? And and they and they can then do whatever that user can do. And that's one. That's why I said it's better for you to only have read access to files than write because if the the, the computer program has to act with credentials. Right. And so Troy would say that the most common, Troy Hunt, that is, would say the most common way that for people to uh, break into your system is that your your credentials are used all over the internet. They find them and then they try them on your system. But there are other ways to get in as well. Yeah. But the bottom line is if you click, well, one of the ways that ransomware gets delivered is through a phishing attack where someone sends you an email, gets you, tricks you into clicking on a link, and you run a program with your credentials that encrypts all your files. You do the work for them. Yeah, social engineering, right? I mean, yeah. you're basically tricking people into um, clicking on something, which by default means that you you uh, it has their credentials when it executes. There's been several nasty um, I- increases in the in the lethality of ransomware. There's been two that I've been tracking. One is that in the last couple of years because people stop paying ransoms as often as the ransom takers would like, they, they now steal some data, the, the data that they think is the most damaging. And they threaten to publish that data on the internet if you don't pay the ransom. So, so this, this, so the, wait a minute, do the do, <laughs> <laughs> extortion, do these hijackers have popular blogs with social status so much that they can publicize it it's, without use, get tipping their hand. They just use that anonymous. That sounds kind of <laughs> dumb, doesn't it? <laughs> they use anonymous sites like Pastebin and other right. places to post. Yeah, but the who data. cares? Who who in their right mind is going to read that? Right? <laughs> Journalists. Yeah, right. Um, I suppose hackers? it matters who you are. Like if you break into the president of the United States computer and the president's doing bad things, and they say, "Okay." president this is going to be all over the news we're going to call you know every every news outlet in the world then yeah, yeah i see that but most companies are afraid. well a lot of companies don't that have source code don't want the source code released because the comments might not be politically correct yeah uh, a lot of people don't want their emails released because they may have candid conversations about um, you know, their business partners where they call them bad names <laughs> right. and they don't want to spoil. I mean, it, it can be anything. The problem is it's the unknown. What if they, what if they release something that then embarrasses us? Right. What if they find out right. that we, we don't, we don't, um, we, we don't have the safest practices in our minds or what if we ignored this, uh, EPA ruling, mm. you know, it's those yeah. little dirty laundry. So, so that's one thing is the extortion okay. part. And the other is there's a new one. Uh, it's not new, it's about over a year old, called Emotet, where if there's an insurance company downstairs from you that gets hit by ransomware, by Emotet, it will use Wi-Fi um, network cards in the computers to try to hack onto your Wi-Fi. Wow. And try to jump to your network. So you don't even have to click on anything for it to get to you because it will try to get onto your network and try to hack it that way. All right. So how do we prevent against this stuff that's a long conversation <laughs> that is a long conversation what's the what's the uh, simplest you know what I, thing i'm going to tell do? you fire all your users yeah, no <laughs> no what i'm going to tell you is that <laughs> the most simple thing to do is is some simple security hygiene right um make sure you're patched all the time make sure you you have password rotations um like i use a password manager i don't even know my passwords for all my sites all my sites i have no idea what my passwords are i use a password manager so a password manager is something that you subscribe yep. to that you uh, essentially keeps all of your passwords and generates new ones on a regular basis. So you really only have to remember one right. password. It's a 21st century piece of paper that you write your passwords <laughs> on. And you right. can tell it yeah. you want 30 characters and upper, lower and special characters and it will go generate passwords like that. And you don't even need to worry about it, which is awesome. So the most popular one is LastPass, yep. right? Yeah, and I use One Pass, but either they both offer one pass, they, pass. they both offer about the same features and functionality, and I think cost wise are about the same. So, so how do I use it? How do I log in to my Windows machine with LastPass if uh, I'm not even logged in? So how can I access LastPass? Uh, <laughs> that's that's a good question. 
LastPass and, and one password are probably things better for websites that you're interacting with externally um, or uh-huh. home resources if you have like a Synology or something along those lines. Um, so you need two passwords, yeah. one for your computer yeah. and one for your last password. Okay, so here's a password. dilemma. I love this. This is great. This is why we started the show. Here's a dilemma. I have my my password for Windows is my Microsoft password, and it's connected to all my Microsoft mm-hmm. accounts. It's connected to Azure, mm. right? Yes. Now, if I change my password, it's going to change everywhere for all of those Microsoft things. Yes. And, and uh, so, yeah, I, so that can come back to bite me, can it? It sure can. And one of the things I would tell you is, although rotating your passwords is important, um, something that's probably more important at this point, although you can still bypass it because everything's bypassable, but would be multi-factor authentication or MFA. Yeah. So Microsoft yeah. has this fantastic authentication app. And most most of yep. them do, but they have a really good one that when I log on to a website with my username and password, or I log into a new workstation with my username and password that Microsoft has, literally pops up on my phone saying, hey, uh, did you try and log in over here? The shoot? And I can say, yeah, that was yep. me, or no, it wasn't, right? And, that's and it awesome. logs you right yeah. in. Yeah. So that would be our second recommendation is always, always, always use MFA. I. I have an extreme recommendation because Uh-oh. I'm just an old an old guy. <laughs> an old this military I, guy. This, this is why I tell Rough. you this is where I tell Broken. you to get off my lawn. <laughs> get off my lawn. Take out um, your gun and uh, shoot the computer. I, I hope they never do away with this feature, but Microsoft allows you to install without an online password and just create an offline right. account. And it's imp- incredibly painful because they trick you and make you think you can't do it, but you can. And I always install and, and never use my Microsoft Live account because of the exact reason you state. Yep. I don't want that account to be the same as the one I log in with. So I use offline accounts. But I still want to log into those things when I get into Windows. I understand that. But it's just it's one of the ways that I like I don't allow OneDrive to log in automatically. I don't like I don't allow anything to log in automatically <laughs> when I log into a computer. Right, right. That's because okay. I, I'm, I'm around Dwayne often. <laughs> yeah. And uh-huh. he's scary. <laughs> okay. So uh, rotate your passwords. Uh, what about stuff like UbiKey? What is that? So they're good too. Um, that there's, you either have something you know, obviously your password, um, uh, and something you can potentially get access to, like an MFA, whether it's an SMS or whatnot. But then... What the hell are you talking about? <laughs> but... <laughs> What does that mean? This alphabet soup. We'll clarify it out ASAP. (laughs) Okay, sorry. Um, So the standard principles around security. Well, first of all, Ubi key is a USB key, right? I was getting there. Yes. All right. Hey, you know what? You just described a product with an acronym, (laughs) USB. What does that Uh, mean? Yeah, okay. At least it's a well-known acronym. So those keys, the great thing about those keys is it's physical, right? So it's something that you can plug in that you have access to that, that has a unique key. Um, like think of it okay. like an X509 uh, <laughs> asynchronous oh, encrypted no, algorithm. Don't, don't think of it. Don't think that. Uh, <laughs> a public private key. <laughs> Never mind that. <laughs> that you can plug in and it. This it, is no, harder it's, than it I, sounds. It is, right? is, we may spend a couple podcasts just on terminology. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so I okay. like those keys. The only thing I don't like about physical devices like that um, is a they they can be lost which stinks you could lose them which would suck um and then yep. you know so then you have to go through getting a new one and resetting everything and that sort of stuff um they could right. be stolen right so yeah. that's possible as well um so there's 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 things i generally don't like about them but uh, they're good they're good another layer of of uh, defense they're difficult well, at the swim up yeah. bar uh is it if you use one of these to say log into your local machine, can you give it the option that um, a, a backup password could also be used if you lose your key? So a lot of these will give you the ability to do some backup. It's either a really long single use code um, where you can say, right. hey, listen, I wrote this thing down on a piece of paper and I put it under my keyboard just in case right. I lose this key, I can log in and reset it so that I can just remove the right. key and add a new one. Um, so yeah, those, those options are available as well. And, and some of the software that comes with these keys, and I don't know, cause I have not used one yet, but I plan to, uh, some of the software, from what I understand, you just plug it in your USB port, it logs you in. And then every website 
you never ever have to log into anything again. Is it using something like LastPass or is it in and of itself a password manager? Do you know? Uh, yeah. So it's using its own flavor of password management. Um, yeah. So it's not leveraging it's like vault. a OnePass or a LastPass or anything like that. It has its own vault that it can access with okay. its own crypto keys it, it, and use. It's not a difficult technology to implement. Yeah. It's just the devil's in the details. Sure. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we've tortured our listeners enough for today. Uh, we can- <laughs> you know, what's funny is I didn't think it would be this hard to, <laughs> yeah. to not talk acronyms and not to go super deep into. Oh, well, the assumptions yeah. are, are 15 yeah. thick. That's the right. problem. Uh, you know what we're going to have to do? I'm going to have to have uh, Kelly, my wife, listen as we're recording yes. and I'll just watch her face. <laughs> and anytime she turns sideways and looks up at the ceiling, I'm going to say, Stop. <laughs> Because, you know, there are probably some that slipped by me this time, too. So, Well, so we we, we really want to make this, for those who are listening, we want to make it approachable. Yeah. Uh, we want to make it engaging. We want to make it topical. But we don't want to be jargony. But it's hard because we're in a world where it's been decades of, right. of us doing this stuff. Right. But hopefully if we just take that a little extra time and explain things to you, uh, then you won't feel so dumb and we will feel all the dumber. <laughs> or, so. you'll, or you'll feel super smart because you know all the acronyms already. Right. So uh, that's it. Follow us on Twitter. I'm at Carl Franklin. I'm at Patrick Hines. And I'm at D. LaFlot. Thanks, guys. Thanks. And we'll see you uh, next time on Security This Week. Security This Week.